The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Good morning and welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod. We're coming to you live. It's Monday morning. What's the date? It is, oh my gosh, it's the 8th of August. Uh, I got to check the calendar because I don't remember. Anyway, thrilled coming to you still from my office. I know we've been bouncing around and doing different things. Sometimes we're in the studio, sometimes we're in the control room now, and sometimes we're in my office. Anyway, I'm thrilled to be here and thrilled for this entire week. I love the conversation that we're going to be having today because we're talking specifically, it's a parent to parent talk specifically about positive reinforcement because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about positive reinforcement. And I think it's sort of like the arrow on the FedEx truck that once you see it, then you see it and you can't unsee it. But until you see it, it seems like it's, you know, people are talking about it and you're like, I don't get it. I don't get what you're talking about. And I have seen so many people when they get the positive reinforcement thing, so much else makes sense. So I'm hoping that you have a light bulb moment today. Uh, a couple of things I want to remind you of that uh, we're here. Autism Live is the number one rated autism podcast. That's thanks to you guys. That's because you like, you share, you tell other people. It's as simple as if you're watching this and you go, you know, this information is something that my friend Alice should really know. Something you can do is, is pop their name into the, the chat in Facebook, and then they don't have to go look for it. They can find what it was you were watching, why you thought that uh, it would be good for them. I'm just seeing that I didn't bring the chat up on my computer. Uh, there we go. Anyway, I'm saying good morning to Laurie and to Susie B. So thrilled that you guys are here. Um, okay, Traven, is, is, we're reconfiguring everything because we're getting a little bit, we, you know, it's always this time of year. I swear it's got to do something with the heat that we always have issue with our sound this time of year. It's like my August problem. <laughs> do you know what I mean? So we're getting a pop, uh, a mic pop. So Trayvon's going to tell me if we need to change something. But in the meantime, I apologize, you guys. We're chasing it down every single day. I apologize. You you know, we, we try to give you good content and we try to do it and, and present it in a picture that looks okay, that you can see and that you can hear okay. And some days we struggle. So do let us know and Traven, tell me what to do, when to do, and we'll proceed with that. Okay. Uh, but in the meantime, I do want to say that we are live right now on Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitter, and about a dozen other places. And eventually Traven will show you some of those places and uh, how you can get in contact with us. Don't forget that, as I said, we are a podcast. We do podcasts to pretty much any place where you can get a podcast for free and download it for free. We're there. We don't uh, exist on places where it costs you money. I, you know... I guess we could, but we try really hard to make it in places that it's free. But if enough of you say, hey, I really like it on this place because whatever, sure, we'll do that too. Uh, okay. Uh, all right. So Traven, do what you got to do. He's just sending me messages. So in any case, um, today we are going to be taking on, we, we've been all this summer, we've been taking a little break from our normal format where we have a lot of guests on the show. It's not because we don't love our guests. We absolutely do. But a lot of people took the summer off and it just, I had some really we archive of things that were talks that I had been doing during the pandemic with groups of parents that we hadn't shared on Autism Life. And of course, a lot of that information I put in my book, Autism Parent to Parent, but you know me, you know, I'm like, I want to make information available for you wherever you can get it. So we thought we would go through some of the different talks because we were told that they were super helpful by parents and we want to be helpful to you, whether you're a parent, whether you yourself are a person on the spectrum, whether you're somebody who works with individuals on the spectrum, or you're somebody who just flat out loves people and maybe love someone in particular special, um, we want to be a help and resource to you. That's what our whole show is about. So we've been doing these things called parent to parent talks. 
normally I give you the disclaimer at the start of the show and I say, I'm not an expert in the field of autism. And, and that's what I talk with you about. And then we bring on guests and we say, talk to them about what it is that you need to do. And um, Traven's, um, I, do you notice that? I just lost an earring and Traven's sneaking in mm-hmm. to fix some things on the computer. We got lots of things going on here. Uh, so in any case, uh, these are narrative talks. There's not an expert here. I'm not an expert. I am somebody who's been in this community for a lot of years because my son was diagnosed in 2006, which to me seems like a long weekend ago, but it really is several, many years ago. And um, I've been hosting shows about autism for, uh, you know, I think I'm over 15 years now, all combined, uh, this show and a radio show before this. So I am not an expert in the field of autism, but I've interviewed a lot of experts and I've had a lot of on the ground experience. So I have an informed opinion and I have learned a couple of trips, uh, not trips, tip. What am I trying to say, Tri- Trevin? Tricks tricks of the trade that I like to share to make you be able to get to what you have to get to faster. So, uh, we're, we're monkeying with my internet here, but don't mind, uh, don't mind the man behind the curtain. Uh, it's very hard for me. I have to focus in any case. Uh, so that's what these talks are about. The parent to parent it's advice from one parent potentially to another parent. Although if you're not a parent, if you know, whoever else you were on that list, caregiver, if you're somebody who just deeply cares about people on the spectrum or you, yourself or the person on the spectrum, I hope that it will be elucidating to you what these terms are and what people are talking about, because knowledge is power. That's what I always say. So today's talk is about positive reinforcement. And um, this is something, a phrase that gets batted around all the time. Uh, People talk about this and they don't always know what they're talking about. And I find that disconcerting because if um, if we're really uh, trying to help someone, anyone, whether it's a person on the spectrum, anyone, if we're trying to help them, then and we're batting these terms around as if we know them and we don't, it's really harmful. And that uh, gravely, gravely concerns me. So uh, Trayvon's got my PowerPoint. He's getting it back up after all the things that we did. But what we're going to talk about is positive reinforcement and what's so reinforcing about it and and why it, it is a term that I hear all the time in schools now. People go, oh, yeah, we use positive reinforcement. But a lot of times that is not, in fact, what they're doing. Do we are we able? Um and we're having some connection issues. There's two things that I want to tell you guys about if you still have me. One of them is that it's tomorrow night at midnight that Lock and Key season three drops. And the final season of Lock and Key and why do we care so much? Well, it's a really good show on Netflix, first of all. I will tell you that. And if your kids can handle, there are some spooky, um, creepy parts to it. Um, so be very cautious in terms of that. But it's very Scooby-Doo kind of spooky, creepy. There's maybe one episode in season two that I would say is a little bit more spooky, creepy, that you have to kind of, you know, prep your kids if they're people who are get real affected by that kind of thing. But it's super fun. It's fun. Funny, it's clever. The whole family will enjoy it. It's a different way of looking at things. It's based on a graphic novel. And the reason why we super love it is because it features Kobe Bird as Rufus. Kobe Bird has been on the show. He's like part of our family. He is, he, what am I talking about? He is part of the family. He's absolutely part of the Autism Live family. He hosts for us sometimes. Uh, uh, he used to do that for us on the red, but thank you, Trayvon. And um, so we're thrilled. Uh, that in season three, he was in season one and he was in many of the episodes in season one, had some big things and we were so excited to see him. He is an actor who is uh, on the spectrum and to see him working at that level, we'd already watched him on Good Doctor. We'd already watched him on Speechless, but to be this, you know, wonderful recurring character on this hit show was really cool. Then season two came around and he was still in it, you know, but he wasn't as front and central And we were all kind of a toast. The show was still good, but it wasn't as good. You know what I'm saying? And 
and people who were friends of the the original graphic novel went, where's Rufus? Rufus is a big deal. And look, where did he go? Where did he go? And so we're so excited that all we know is that he got bumped from being a recurring character to being a principal, which means he's in more of it. I can only assume, right? You don't get that unless you're doing more. So I am stupid excited. Thank you, Autism Journey with Elijah. You may have, might have come in later. We're, we were playing with our connection. Hopefully I'm not glitching anymore. Um, hopefully. Can you write and tell us again now if if I'm still so that Trayvon knows because we are having some issues still this morning and we were playing with some things. But in any case, tomorrow at midnight, lock and key drops. You're going to wa have watched the first two seasons, do a refresher, and we're going to be talking about it a lot here because we love the show and we love Kobe. And this is the final season and we can only suspect that he's in significantly more. I've seen a couple of the reviews and they've been raves for him. So um, thank you, Autism Journey with Elijah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So um, the other thing is, is that I, I am uh, caught up. There are still, I think, four more episodes to drop of Extraordinary Attorney Wu. I have a lot of feelings about it. We're going to talk more about that um, next week when we do Let's Talk Movies. But I really think that it's important that people watch uh, it is a, a K-drama on Netflix. It is subtitles. Um, and the first episode was a little janky for me. It was a little hard for me because the actress who's playing the character is not on the spectrum. And there were some things that I was like, eh, eh, this makes the case for why authentic representation is better. But the, the, the script and the writing is pivotal, earth-changing really want to encourage people to watch it. Okay. So we have the PowerPoint up. Let's go ahead and start talking about positive reinforcement. Uh, cause I want to know what's so positive about it. Right. So, uh, let's start off here. Let me make sure that my thing works. And it didn't that time. I don't know why. Uh, there we go. Okay. So, you know, we do jargon of the day here. And so I wanted to give you the actual definition of positive reinforcement. And of course, whenever possible, I give it directly from the mother source, uh, Cooper, Heron and Hayward, 2007. There, there's a, it's a tome, it's a big book and it's the book that all the behaviorists refer to. Right. And so straight from the horse's mouth, they say positive reinforcement occurs when a behavior is followed immediately by the presentation of a stimulus and as a result occurs more often in the future. That's on page 36 if you're looking for it, if you feel that that's going to help you. It's not the worst definition in the book. It's not the most jargon intensive, but the minute anybody says stimulus, I go, right? I don't know about you, but I go, what? why do you have to use that word? Um, it's jargon. Uh, so we give you the working definition here. Uh, it's a meaningful reward that makes an individual want to repeat the result. Now, my imperfect working definition leaves out the one of the most important things, which Cooper, Heron, and Hayward don't, which is that it's that a behavior happens and then it's followed by an immediate something or other. So a behavior happens and there is a meeting, uh, immediate meaningful reward that actually makes it so meaningful that the person who engaged in the behavior wants to repeat what just happened. So I did something, I got this meaningful reward, and then I want to do it again because why wouldn't I want to do it again, right? So this is one of the cornerstones of effective ABA. You can I tell if ABA is working and if it's good, if we're using positive reinforcement and we're using it correctly, we're going to see a bunch of things that happen as a result of that. But you should be able to see with your eyes that if you or your child engages in a behavior that is a behavior that we're working on. And, and sometimes it's not even the full behavior. Sometimes it's just an approximation of the behavior. And, and there's an immediate, immediate, meaningful reward that is so meaningful that the child or you goes, I like this. I'd like to do that again. That is positive reinforcement. So think about that, about the fact that it has to be meaningful because you can reward somebody up, down, and sideways. But if it's not speaking their love language, it's really a waste of time and it doesn't encourage the behavior to happen again. 
right? So it has to be meaningful. And the result has to be that the person is willing to do it again, because it's so rewarding. This is the cornerstone of good ABA. So when people say, oh, well, the kids are tortured, I go, something's not right. Because that nowhere in ABA does it say torture someone into doing something. What it does is, is it says, give them a reason to want to do it again. Give them a reason that's meaningful to them. Now, I know some of you are going, eh, I still don't like it. Stick with me. I think at the end of this talk, I will, we will certainly take questions and opinions and all of that. But, but let me explain all of the things things to it before you decide you're not want to do it. All right. Uh, so moving on here, now that we know what it is, um, it's much more mainstream than we give credit to, right? People talk about positive reinforcement, but they don't always know what they're talking about. So let's get clear about it. But we all engage in it every day. And Dr. Phil bases everything that he does on his show on this principle, right? What does Dr. Phil say? Whenever somebody's talking about something, he's got family there. And I remember this one guy, it's the example that I always give, that the guy was doing drugs and he kept taking money out of his mother's purse. And the mother, you know, was was like, I'm going to lose my kid. And and there, there were all these things. And, and what does Dr. Phil say? He says, okay, so you're stealing from your mother. How do you feel about that? And the guy says, I feel really bad about it. And he goes, yeah, I'm not buying that because you keep doing it. So what's the payoff from stealing from your mother? What's your paycheck for stealing? And obviously the paycheck is he gets the money and he goes and gets high. And there's not really any terrible consequence for him. He's getting a paycheck because I'm reporting him to the police, right? He's getting his paycheck for it. And Dr. Phil talks about this in both ways, that if somebody's engaging in a behavior, let's look at what their payoff is for it and let's cut it off so that they don't, if it's a behavior like you're stealing from your mother to get drugs, we don't want to encourage that behavior. So let's cut off the blood supply. Let's cut off the payoff. Mom doesn't keep money in her purse anymore. Mom doesn't have to argue, by the way. Mom doesn't have to call the police. Mom doesn't keep money in her purse in her house. It's inconvenient, right? Because to have to hide your money from your own kid. But guess what? You know, we're willing to do all kinds of things when it's our kids' well-being, right? And mom goes, I don't, I don't know why I didn't think about that before, right? But on the other equation, you know, there are things that we can be doing to help this person so that they can get away from their addiction. And every time they take a step away from their addiction, we want to give them a big payoff for that, something that's meaningful to them so that they're more willing to engage in that behavior than another. Am I oversimplifying it? Yes. But it's important to understand what the basis of this is and how widespread this is, that we all do this and that it's not just for autism. Positive reinforcement is a part of pretty much every every corporate structure, every school, every, but are they doing it right? Are we doing it right? This is the key to the, the big questions to win for the day. And we want to win for the day, don't we? Uh, okay. So let's just do a refresher course about the ABCs of behavior that um, the, the behavior, they've done all these studies. And, and one great way to think of behavior is this, they call it the three-term contingency. So when you see behavior, it's a three-term contingency with a three-term contingency with a three-term contingency, right? So there's all, it's the ABCs. That's all you have to remember is the ABCs. A is antecedent. It's something happens. It's the what's before. Then the behavior happens. And then there's a consequence. Now, the other day we talked about a lot of antecedent strategies, like things that you can do to set the person up for success, things that you can do to um, prevent them from being in a place like, you know, um, making sure that they're not hungry or tired, right? So that they're not having to engage in behavior, giving them attention so they don't get to a point where they have to act out to get attention. Those are all antecedent modifications, right? Great. So useful. We need to know about antecedent modifications. But we haven't really talked about consequence strategies, like what to do for consequences. And people, I don't know what it is in our society, especially here in the United States, we immediately go to punishment. We're like, I will punish that behavior out of existence. Let me ask you something. How's that working for you? Right? 
How is that working for us as a society? If we could punish people out of behavior, wouldn't it stand to reason that there would be fewer needs for prisons than more needs for prisons? So what's wrong with the equation? Can flip this and look at this in a different way? Because if punishing the strategy isn't working, can we reward other behavior so that that behavior doesn't actually happen? And you know what? Tons of studies have been done on this. I mean, probably in the hundreds of thousands of studies, right? And both on individuals on the spectrum and people not on the spectrum. And it turns out that positive reinforcement is much, much more effective at changing behavior than punishing someone. Think about that for a second. That if, if what we really want to do is change the behavior, that if we put positive reinforcement on something else, it's much more likely to change the behavior. Why aren't we taught that in school? Why aren't we raised that way? Why aren't parents taught that? Well, congratulations, we made it here. And I never was taught this until I had a child with autism, but it was really, you know, something that was massaged into me as a parent. And now I look everywhere and I go, what do you mean? Everybody doesn't know this. So maybe this is one of the great things that we can say, hey, at least I'm here. At least I'm able to learn this. And I'm telling you, it's life changing when you get this. And when you start implementing it into your life, you're going to go, holy business. My life is so much better knowing this. And then you'll forget it like me and, and have to relearn it again every day because it's been drilled into us that, um, you know, yakking at somebody and um, doing all that, it's going to be effective at changing behavior and it's not. So here are some possible examples of positive reinforcement. This is not an exhaustive list. This is not meant just for children. But for all of us, right? For some of us, praise is very reinforcing. And remember, if it doesn't make you want to do the behavior more often, then it's not your reinforcer right now yet, but it can be. We're going to talk about that in a second. So praise, getting a reward for something, get it, getting a paycheck or money, a literal paycheck. You did something and you got a paycheck, you're more likely to come back next week, aren't you? Only if the paycheck is big enough to overcome whatever it was you had to do, right? Um, some kind of an award. Um, people, there are people who you give us, them a certificate and they do, do all kinds of things, right? For some people, it's a food treat. Don't worry. We're going to talk about that too. A prize, toys for kids, freedom of choice time. If you think about this for a second, companies do all this research on can we do to make our employees want to stay longer? Because, you know, when you invest in an employee and you train them, you want them to stay longer, right? So they do all kinds of research on this and everybody thinks, oh, well, you just pay them more money. Sure, that's definitely reinforcing for a lot of people. But it's not the only thing that people find reinforcing. And when you put a survey out to workers and say, what would make you feel better about your job? Some of the things are freedom of choice and freedom of time. That you know you have flexibility. That if you need to not come in one day, that you have that flexibility. People, that means more, more than the paycheck. That you know making money is important, and they want to make a certain amount of money. But what will keep them longer in the job is freedom of choice or freedom of time. For many people, especially you know a long time ago, they would stay in a job just for the health benefits because they wanted to keep the interest and they would stay in a job that they hated. But that was a big enough reward to keep that behavior happening. I have benefits. My family can go to the hospital when they need to. Was enough. Right? right? So it's constantly, is it rewarding enough? Um, I just watched, uh, you know, that show where they they go through the genealogy and last night they were doing Bradley Whitford, who's a great fan and uh, an ally to the autism community shows up all the time at, at autism, which we really appreciate. And uh, he said that one of the things his dad used to always say to him is, uh, how's the struggle? Is it worth it? And I thought, oh, isn't that in interesting? Because I was putting together the PowerPoint for this and I was like, that's really what it's about, right? How is the struggle? And is it worth it? 
And when we make it worth somebody's while, they will go through whatever the struggle is. They will find the way to go through it. Even little kids on the autism spectrum, if it's worth it for them, they will work through something that's frustrating for them. Uh, And sometimes some of the things are um, frustrating for them. But here's the key. Reinforcers are personal and they change often. So I know that you love chocolate cake. And I think to myself, well, I, you know, I've got this really difficult thing that I I need for you to come and do with me. That's going to take hours. Maybe I'm going to ask you to clean out my garage. I'm going to make a chocolate cake. And, um, cause I know you love chocolate cake, but it just so happens it's a really hot day and you were someplace and you ate a ton of chocolate cake the day before and your stomach is a little queasy thinking about a chocolate cake. Now you still love chocolate cake. It's just not today. Do you know what I'm saying? And by the way, if I came to your house to do something to help you and you made me chocolate cake, I'm allergic to everything in a chocolate cake, the chocolate, the, the milk, the wheat, I'm allergic to it all. And by the way, the sugar. So a chocolate cake is not going to be the reinforcer for me, right? So we want to be mindful about the individual, what's reinforced. That's why I said the meaningful reinforcer, it has to mean something to that person. And we also have to be mindful of the fact that if all you ever do is give me that reinforcer at a certain point, you know, he may not be that reinforcing anymore because the experts call it satiation, that we're full of chocolate cake. We don't want more. You can only eat so much chocolate cake in a day. I know there are people who disagree with me, Uh, but, but you know what I'm saying? Like um, what we want today isn't necessarily what we want tomorrow. And everyone is that way, including kids who are on the autism spectrum. So we're going to cycle back to this, but remember this because it's at the bottom of everything. What's reinforcing to you is not necessarily reinforcing to your partner and is not necessarily what's reinforcing to your kid or your coworker, right? Um, So you kind of have to know their love language, right? Okay. So, oh, I keep forgetting that that doesn't work. Here we go. Uh, All right. So how do we know what people like? Well, the experts call it doing a preference assessment. I know with the jargon, right? But basically we're trying to figure out, I'm checking in with you to see what it is that you want. And I can do this in a lot of different ways. People go, well, I have a nonverbal two-year-old. How am I supposed to ask them what I want? It doesn't have to be vocal, um, how you ask them what they, I watch them do this with little babies that um, babies that aren't even sitting up yet where, you know, they take three stuffed animals and, you know, they hold them up in front of the child and the child will reach for one of them. Okay. And we go, oh, well, they like the stuffed dog. Maybe because what they do is they take and change the position. Might be they liked what's ever on their left side right? Or it might be that they, what we find over time is they, they're drawn to the blue thing, right? So we, we don't guess, but we can check in. And I, I honestly, I, therapists, I, I watch them do this with my son. I've watched them, them do this with so many other kiddos where they'll take three things and they put it in front of them and the child reaches out for it and they pick it up. They don't tease them with it. They pick it up and they go, yay, you pick the doggy here. Let's try again. And they make it fun and they move the position of it and go, which one, which one? And the baby leans forward and takes a different one this time. They go, oh, yay, make it very reinforcing. And they, you know, the doggy gives them kisses or whatever is reinforcing to them and they change it again and the child picks again and and they get a sense. You may not always know exactly what what the individual or the child or the baby or the teen or the adult wants, but you get a sense, right? Some of this is about throwing things at the wall and seeing what sticks, right? But you have to do preference assessments frequently. I think that this is one of the big places where so many people kind of drop the ball because teachers, for instance, will be like, oh, well, you know, I know your child likes this, so I'm just going to hammer on that. But remember what we talked about satiation, that sometimes you want something different. So we don't just assume. 
We ask by doing the preference. And there are a million different ways to do a preference assessment. Um, you know, when kids are older and more verbal, they'll say, what do you want to work for? What do you want to do today? What do you want to work for? And they'll give them choices. We don't make them have to pick from the entire ethos. What is it that you want? We give them choices. And sometimes there are three choices that we very specifically want right? That maybe they would like a four. We give them the three choices. Uh, which thing would you like the most? Do you want to play with my phone? Do you want to go for a walk? Do you, you know, want to play with a dog, right? We try to make them things that will be meaningful to them because otherwise it's not going to be a reinforcer. If it's not meaningful enough to them to make them, you know, want to do the behavior again, then it did, it failed short. It's not a reinforcer. It's just a, you know, a blip. Uh, okay. So we check in with them. What do they want? Great. We have a sense of what that is. And then we, you know, we'll do something with them and give them that reward. And then we're going to check again. What do you want to work for now? Right. But we keep checking in, checking in. But then we also check, did it work? If I gave you the walk, which was the thing you said you wanted, and we go for the walk, and now I want to once again, maybe, you know, we were working on colors, and we were working on the color red, and you said you were going to work for a walk, and you, you know, did whatever it was, the work you needed to do, and now we go for a walk, and we come back from the walk, and I say, okay, let's work on red again, and you're like, like I really, I really don't want to, and I'm saying, but if you do, we'll go for another walk, nah, not that reinforcing, or at least not that reinforcing right now, right, I got to change it up. It's never the student's fault, right? I got to constantly be bobbing and weaving with my reinforcers to make sure that I'm offering you enough to make the struggle worthwhile, like Bradley Whitford's dad. We don't assume, and we don't assume that it will work all the time. I see parents and teachers getting so bummed out because they're like, oh, I found what the reinforcer was and it worked and we were doing it and we got a week in and now the reinforcer is not working anymore. And I go, oh, <laughs> it's not going to work all the time. It's not a magic trick, right? It's checking in with the person saying, what's meaningful to you? I'm going to give you the thing that's meaningful. It's this transaction and it constantly has to be massage. It's not something you can, I think that's what's hard for everybody is that it's like, oh, it's like you're constantly on shifting sand. But once you get it and you start to key into it, you'll see that it can be very fun. And that actually figuring out what is reinforcing can be very fun. You kind of play detective. And as you're playing detective, you get to know your kid or your student that much more, which is getting to know them, right? The thing that often you guys say, I just, I want to know my child. I want to understand what makes them tick. I want to, I want to know how their brain works. This is how figuring out what they like, right? Okay. So here are the problems that you guys will write in and say to me all the time. You'll say, well, I don't know what they want. We just talked a little bit about a preference assessment, but if you're really like, you don't even know what three things to put in front of a child, then we're in the spaghetti on the wall thing. <laughs> this is how I refer to it. You got to throw a lot of spaghetti. And, and one of the things that I encourage people to do is be adventuresome. Take your child places, introduce them to new things. I'm so sad that there aren't as many toys because I used to say to people, take an afternoon and go to Toys R Us, put your kid in the shopping cart when they're older, stick them in the back of the shopping cart and shovel toys into the cart and shop and let them play with the toys while you shop. What a great preference assessment. And you'll see that they'll play with something and they'll go, this is really cool. And three seconds over the side of the, the shopping cart and they're on to something else right? But then you see the toy that they spend a little bit more time with and you go, ah, that might be the toy, right? Um, there are fewer stores like that now. Now it's mostly mom and pop. But what I love about the mom and pop toy stores is that they usually have a play area and they have toys out for your child to go play. Everybody says, I can't afford to go to Chuck E. Cheese. Don't go to Chuck E. Cheese. Go to the toy store. Find the mom and pop toy store in your area and find out, you know, call ahead and say, when is it the least busy? It's usually in the morning. Take your child or children. And a lot of times they have a specific play area 
for you. Bring some, you know, something so that if you need to, you can hydrate yourself and your kids, but do it kindly so you don't spill all over their toys. These are people that are in business too, right? But see what they like. But also take your kids to museums, take them to concerts, take them to all these places because you don't know what the thing is that's going to light them up. You don't know what it is yet. We went, um, we found all, I would go through the internet and, and there used to be these guides that they would give you for the month about free things that were happening. Now, yes, I live in Los Angeles. So there were many, many, many more things, but I guarantee you there's things going on in your neck of the woods that you may not know about. Right. But I would make a schedule of things so that we had places to go. And there was one thing that they did in Pasadena and they called it a musical petting zoo. And I was like, what is a musical petting zoo? Uh, you know, and they said, you know, we're going to have a, a musical uh, demonstration. There'll be a musical petting zoo. And I thought, are they going to bring goats into the theater? No, what they did, and obviously this was pre-COVID, they brought in all the instruments from the orchestra. And even then they had wipes set up and you stood in line for each um, instrument and you could go all the way around the circle and you had an opportunity to play each instrument stop. Oh my gosh. I, like all the adults wanted to participate, but it was just kids. My son, like, you know, I hear some of you saying, but my child won't stand in line. The first time that we did it, one of us had to stand in line for him while the other one took him and did something else to distract him until we got to the front of the line. They agreed that we could do that. We never had to do that again. Do you know why? It was so reinforcing to him. He was willing to stand in the line, something we've not done before. You know why? Because the reinforcer of getting to play the instrument was a reinforcer. And he was willing to go through the struggle of standing in line to play the instrument. And we saw, okay, we have a kid who's interested in music. One of the things that I always say is, if you're really struggling here and you have no idea what your child likes, try to figure out which one of your child's senses is the strongest for them, right? So um, for some kids, it's touch. These are the kids who are constantly touching the, the smooth stuff. And maybe you want to get them a silky or something like that. Um, for some kids, it's visual. They, they're the screen kids. They want to be on the screen. Um, you know, that's the thing. They, they love it when there's things that are bright and images and things like that. And maybe, you know, that the reinforcer is being able to watch a video or maybe it's art and painting and all of those things. And I would take those kids to do all of those things. Um, for, for kids that, you know, that hearing is a very big sense for them. And we realized for my son, it was, um, a lot of times music, ooh, the things music can do for those kids. And sometimes those are the kids that are really sensitive and that are doing this to their ears because they, they're they so sensitive to sound, but they love certain sounds and not other sounds, right? So sometimes classical music is the thing for those kids. Other kids, it is taste. They're con Those are the kids that are like mouthing and are touching things. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's uh, uh, they have um, lip balm that has... Um, flavors that that can be really reinforcing. There are all kinds of things. Uh, Autism Journey with Elijah says Arizona has aquariums and it is wonderful. He loves it. He wants to live there. LOL, we can't go as often as he wants to. Uh, it's pricey. So we do virtual aquariums online. It works for a little while, but not as long. It's just enough to pass the time at the moment. Can I suggest something? Have you reached out to the aquarium and said, here's my deal and how much would it be for a pass so that we could come all the time? Because I guarantee you that they might already have something like that and that they would be interested in your story. And museums sometimes have a special program that's an outreach program and they're trying to, they're, you know, I've had, I've consulted at two museums now who are trying to build, um, the experience for people who are neurodiverse. So will you do me a favor and just call them and let them know your story and say, we'd like to come more often. And my child loves it so much because down the road, maybe that's where he does his first internship. And I mentioned Extraordinary Attorney Wu. Now you have to watch it because she loves all things whales. Um, and everything is a whale or a porpoise or something um, to her. And 
it'll it'll resonate with you uh, when you watch that show. But reach out to them. Museums and aquariums and things like that, they want to be a better ally to communities like ours, but they don't always know how to. Tell them what you would like, right? Um, Odyssey in Scottsdale, Arizona has a sensory option and an annual pass, which pays for itself in three visits. Carrie, so happy to see you. Sorry I missed you on your visit this weekend, um, but happy that you're here and thank you for that information. I do find that when you reach out and find the right person, and I would encourage you to reach out and, and say, who's your outreach coordinator uh, or who is your special needs coordinator, they'll find you the right person. They'll find you the right person, but let's make that happen for your kiddo. And if it's super expensive, you know, I love a good fundraiser because um, it's it's something that can be overcome. Uh, and I, and, you know, it even could be a, a grant from Act Today that you could apply for. Um, yes, check out the pass. Uh, okay, so so when you don't know what it is, throw spaghetti at the wall. And it just doesn't end. When I think about our dear friend, Spencer Hart, who does her own heart to heart here on the show now. And Spencer was a kiddo that I think, you know, her mom just didn't know exactly what it was that was going to be the thing for her. And one day they were getting ready to go someplace. And she would take her daughter. She's a very cultural person, the mom. And so she would take her daughter and they would do all these cultural things. So the TV was on and it was playing Phantom of the Opera. And all of a sudden, Spencer never had a singing lesson in her life, just started singing opera in the living room to the television. And from my understanding of it is you almost had to scrape her mother up off the floor. She was like, what's happening here? Right. And then uh, Spencer has sung at the White House twice, not once, twice, been invited by the country of China to come and speak and sing. Hello. You know what I'm saying? So you don't know until you know throw spaghetti at the wall, be willing, be willing to, you know, I always looked up to find what's the free day at the museum. Um, and you can call ahead and say, I'm bringing my child who's very sensory. I don't know for, you know, is there a discount? Is there a day? Like, you know, fine. I always found the free day, but that always meant that there were 8 million children there on that day, you know? Um, but the nice thing about when it was free is if, if we went in and looked at the big dinosaur bones and we never got to the bird exhibit, we saw the big dinosaur bones and that was an outing. And I just, I was like, free. Okay. We did an outing. We saw dinosaur bones. We did something cultural and I, and I let it go. Um, so that I wouldn't be like, we just spent $80 and we didn't get past the door. You know what I'm saying? Um, but talk to the museums, let them know, but throw spaghetti at that wall, expose them to things because it expands their world and you will find reinforcers. You will. It might take time, but you will. Um, okay. Other people will write in and say, but my child only wants one thing. For I remember the person who wrote in and said, it, it's just, they have a, a Nala from the Lion King stuffed lion and that's it. It's Nala and nothing else is a reinforcer. And you worry about that because you can burn a reinforcer out. If it's all, you're only giving one reinforcer, it can get to the point where they get to satiation and they've already had Nala. So they don't want to do anything anymore. Um, the struggle is not worth it, right? Thank you, Bradley Whitford. Um, so what do we do to build when it's only one thing? Well, we start with that genre. And I remember what our experts told that mom who the child only liked Nala. They said, great, he loves the Lion King. So let's expand it. Let's get a little Nala. Let's get a Nala that, you know, looks a little bit like, because there's different Nalas. There's baby Nala, and then there's young boy Nala, and then there's teenage Nala, and then there's an adult Nala. Let's get different size Nalas um, and different age Nalas. And then let's read a book about Nala. And then let's read the Lion King book and let's watch the video. And by the way, there's, you know, Lion King 2, and then there's two and a half. And now let's get them, you know, so it's Nala and Pumbaa. And, and let's build out, then we're going to take it a, another step further and let's make it, you know, things in, um, on safari and, and, and let's look at pictures of real lions and then, you know, and, and so then it'll be animals and we just, 
build, build, build out from what the core of interest is. For people who tell me their child is just obsessed with Thomas the Tank Engine, that's okay. But then let's make it Thomas and all the other trains, right? You know, it's Thomas and James. And, and then let's, you know, build the track. And then let's watch the show. And then let's read the book. And then let's watch a video that is with real trains. And then let's go to a train museum. We have the best train museum here in Los Angeles, free. And they it's old train cars and they get to climb all over them. Oh, if you come to LA, you must go to Travel Town. Um, we used to go there all the time. So you build out that interest like pizza dough. And sometimes they'll reject one part of it. That's okay. Then we go to another part of it. Um, but just building on that interest that they already have. Um, another thing is that people get all emotional about it. Say, I don't want to bribe them. You're setting up this unrealistic thing. And I don't, I don't like the idea that I have to bribe them to get them to do something. That doesn't seem right. And all I can say to you is that this is what works and it works on all levels of society and that it's not something that's just for kids and it's certainly not something that's just for kids on the spectrum. If you don't like the idea of positive reinforcement and that you do something and you get a positive reinforcement, then then you're saying, I don't like the way society works at all and, and we should do away with money. No one should get a paycheck. Um, everybody should just work for free. Everything should be nonprofit. It, it just isn't how things work. Um, and, and I think it's important that everybody realize that, that we, that is the system and it's the system, not because we arbitrarily decided it's the system because that's what works. It is why people go back to their jobs every morning because they like getting paid. Okay. Um, when people say, well, the reinforcer was working, but it's not now, it's very likely because they're satiated. Right. And that means you got to switch it up a little bit. And that can be hard. Have your emotions about it. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's very doable. You can do it. You just got to go back and think, OK, so what else do I have? I always used to think about, you know, like it's, it's like the artist and I've got a backpack and I've got all these tools. What else have I got? OK, he you know, he's done with that. What's the next thing? I've told you that I used to carry a zipper bag full of little toys so that if we were in a restaurant or the doctor's office and there were toys that had about a two minute attention span to them where they were reinforcing like there was a little wind up monkey that, or a dog or well, I don't remember what it was, but it would flip. And, you know, it would do that over and over again. That's about a two minute thing. And then he'd be on to the next thing. Well, then I had the little egg that had putty in it. Well, that's about a two minute thing. And then I'd pull out the next thing, right? Um, because, you know, they, you get satiated with something. So if the reinforcer isn't working, back off of that, find something else. And then the biggest one I think that uh, parents struggle with is that it gets dicey because the thing that's reinforcing to your child is X, fill in the blank, right? Let's say it's the iPad. Uh, cause a lot of times it's the iPad, right? And then something happens like, I don't know, maybe they throw their iPad, they get mad about something and they throw their iPad. And so what do we do as parents? It's like lock and load. Our immediate response is, Oh, you just lost your iPad. It is like we were pre-programmed to do that. Oh, you just lost your iPad. And now you go, oh, what have I done? I've just taken away my child's reinforcer. And how do I work back from that? Well, first of all, antecedent modification for us, we try not to, uh, first of all, don't take away something if it's their way of communicating ever, ever, ever. If they're using their iPad to communicate, you can never take it away. Even if they threw it, even if they broke it, you can't take it away. That would be like if somebody shouted, you said, I'm going to be like, what's her name in Little Mermaid? And I'm going to take your voice away. Well, you can't and you wouldn't. So you can't, right? If that's their voice, that's the way of communicating. There's no taking it away. Invest in the thing that if they throw it, it can't break. And there are things that, that they guarantee it. And if it breaks, they buy you a new one because you paid for the thing. Um, right? So uh, I'm just reading. Uh, somebody says, uh, we've not gone to the butterfly one, but we'll make it there soon, I'm sure. Thanks uh, so much for the heads up. Ooh, we have a butterfly thing in LA too. That I, I The day that I was there, it wasn't open. But I hear those when you just get to be covered by butterflies. We did one in New Orleans. Uh, great, great, great stuff. 
too much for some kids, not reinforcing for everybody, right? But anyway, let's go back to the, I took it away. If you mess up and we all do, and you will at some point, first of all, you're going to forgive yourself. And you're not going to call yourself names because you took away the reinforcer, right? First bit of business is you got to find a way to give the reinforcer back to them. And you never just give, if you've taken something away, you never just give it back. That's sending the wrong message. What you do is you have them earn it back. And sometimes what you have to do to have them earn it back is that you ask them to do something that you know that they already want to do. What did she just say? (laughs) So if, if, if the child threw the iPad and, you know, we, I said, because I was being my cellular self and I go, that's it. You lost your iPad. Oh, can I hear myself saying that? You've lost your iPad, pal. Hope you're happy. You've lost your iPad now. You don't get it for the rest of the day. And now the child is completely inconsolably upset, right? I'm not going to give too much attention. I'm going to make sure that they're safe. I'm not going to continue yakking at them, right? I'm going to wait until they calm down. I'm going to talk to myself and go, well, I just blew it. And I don't want the rest of the day to be trash. And I need to get back to the point where we're on the reinforcing side of things, not the punishment side of things, because, you know, we're not doing the prison system here because we know it doesn't work. And we know that this does work. So how do I get back there? And once the child calms down, when it's all over and they've calmed down, then we can, you know, when we're, when enough time has passed that it's not connected to them crying and throwing the tantrum, uh, I'm going to say, I'm going to give you one chance to earn your iPad back. Um, and I can do this non-vocally. I don't have to say it this way, but I can say, you know, if you do this, then you get your iPad back. And I make it something ridiculously easy but it's still a request, something that I ask them to do. So I say, um, you know, I need you to jump up and down three times because my child likes to jump. Uh, If you will get on the trampoline and you will jump 13 times, you can have your iPad back. And they go, I don't really know what to make of that, but if you're serious and they'll get on the iPad and they're really eager now, like I want to get that iPad back and I don't want mom to be mad at me. And they jump up and down 13 times and you go, good job. And you give them the iPad back. You do not give a lecture. You give them the iPad back. And now you're back on track and you keep, you know, you, you, the, the, that's a positive reinforcement thing. And you made the mistake, you gave it away, but it's not unfixable. You can always work back. They can always earn back. And you don't have to make it something hard for them to earn it back because what you're doing is saying, I'll work with you, but I'm not going to give you everything. I'll work with you. Okay. Does that make sense? Uh, I hope so. I'm making some of the CBAs break out in hives right now. (laughs) Oh, it's just my job. Okay. So... At school and other places, people will tell you, oh, we we participate in positive reinforcement. It's what we do. We understand it. We read all the science and we know what we're doing. I had my son had one teacher, and listen, this the, she was a lovely teacher and she was a good person. She just didn't understand positive reinforcement. And she was in a tough situation. She was in a classroom that really logistically was probably built for 20 kids. And that might've been pushing it. And guess how many kids she had in her classroom? 52. And listen, I've been that teacher. I've been the teacher where 52 kids are in your classroom and you don't even have enough room for them to safely move around the desk. It's such a shame sometimes what our education system does, right? But this teacher was trying to make the best of it. But part of it was that if a kid tripped on a chair leg and fell down, they would hit other kids' chairs and tables as they went down. It was a safety hazard. So she was militant about when you stood up and got out of your chair, you needed to push your chair in. And she was all about teaching her kids all about that. And that every single time you got up, you have to push your chair in. And she would give them positive reinforcement for that and say, good job. Look, everybody pushed their chair in. And because of that, because everybody pushed their chair in, you get this out or whatever. That's great positive reinforcement. But what would she do when somebody forgot? Then what she would do is make them, she would make the whole class stand there and she would say to the child, I need you to go push your chair in 32 times in front of the whole class, which is shaming them and punishing them. Sorry, 
That is not positive reinforcement, but that is what she would do. And she would say very proudly to all the parents, it teaches them and they never do that again. Well, that is not positive reinforcement. And she would go, oh, but it is, it is. We're not, we, don't, we just stand there and wait while it's like, oh lady. It's not. So positive reinforcement never shames the individual. Not ever. If it is, then you know, not positive reinforcement. Um, Positive reinforcement should make the individual happy. And if it's not, it's not positive reinforcement. It isn't. And if it doesn't increase the behavior happening, it isn't positive reinforcement. But her argument was, oh, it definitely increases the behavior. Yeah, but it's not a positive, (laughs) you know? And I went round and round with her about it um, because she was 100% sure that it was positive. It is not positive reinforcement. Um, So you have to keep an eye on people, even when they say, oh, I know positive reinforcement. I do that all the time. Watch. Watch and see, and it, and you'll you'll be able to tell now that you know the difference. Okay, uh, moving on here because we're running out of time. I did, oh I pushed the thing again. Here we go. Uh, okay, so for those of you who've said, well, but you know, what's reinforcing to my child isn't what I want to be reinforcing. Like my child, you guys talk about praise, 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 praise. Heap more praise on your kids, but. You say praise isn't what is reinforcing to my child. Of course not. Um, it's just like if you hand a one dollar bill to a one year old, they go and set it down because it's not fun. It is. It is not reinforcing in and of itself. Hand a you know a twenty dollar bill to a sixteen year old, and they're like, yeah, thanks, right? And they're like, woohoo! I'll come to your house more often. You hand out twenty dollar bills, right? So what happened between the time that somebody was one and somebody was sixteen that made them like the bill? Well, it was paired with things. So pairing is something that we do when we take something that's already super reinforcing and we put it with something else and we do it over and 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 over again until eventually we can get to the point where we don't even have to give the thing that was initially reinforcing. The other thing is reinforcing all on its baby own. It's like a magic trick and it can be used wrong. Let's be honest about that. But if we're using it correctly, then what we're doing is, uh, and if we're doing it mindfully too, we're building a relationship where, and the thing that we always talk about is praise. So when we, when we give them the thing that they like, let's say that they chose the blue puppy as the thing. And then we make, we go, yes, good job. Good. You chose the blue puppy and we're praising. And I do that over and over and over again for years. So by the time that the child is three, four, and five, they know that when you go, good job, oh, you're so smart. Oh, what a good girl, right? All these things, what a big boy, all these things that that's praise. And they they know, oh, that makes me feel good. It doesn't spring out of nowhere. I put the two pictures there, one of Santa Claus and one of money, because I think those are the perfect examples. Take a one-year-old, and I know because I play Mrs. Claus on a regular basis, take a one-year-old and stick it on Santa Claus's lap and they scream in horror because it's this crazy looking dude dressed all in white. He looks like a wild animal, all this fur and hair and whatever. And they're, they're like, help me. Why would you hand me to this random dude, right? (laughs) Makes no sense. And, you know, at a different point, different kids get to the point where they're they're like, it's Santa. They're like, buddy the elf, it's Santa. And they're so excited. Why? Because Santa has been paired over the years with toys and candy and all this stuff that I like, right? And so it's pairing. So you can do that with anything. And what we encourage is that the first thing that you pair is praise and that you start early and that you do it all the time because it's, it's good when you're able to praise someone and they feel good about it. Um, it's not the be all end all, but it's, you know, it, you'll see so much in ABA therapy that it's kids being told, good job. And can I tell you, when we first saw people doing that with our son, we were like, oh, it's so weird. They're saying good job to him all the time. It just feels weird. It feels like, oh, you know, it's just artificial. It feels wrong. I don't want to do that. I don't want to, I didn't come out of my mouth and I would go, good job. And I would think, ah, 
And then, you know, I saw how he responded to it and I went, oh, I'm going all in on this. I still do. I, you know, I walk by trees in the fall and if they're, I go, good job to the trees because it costs you nothing. And you know what I found in the last 20 years? People like to be told they're doing a good job. Don't be so stick in the mud about it. Say good job. And and you know what I realized recently, both my husband and I and Uh, Both my husband and my son at some point in the last week have said some semblance of the same thing to me of saying, hey, let me know when I do something right, because I've been a little too critical of late. You know, I said to you earlier, you got to learn this and then relearn it and relearn it. Yes, I'm still relearning this. And I was like, oh, have I been too critical lately? And so I was like, oh, I know the, I know this. I know this. So I, I decided, oh, I'm going to, you know, and I just found reasons to say, hey, good job. And you know what I noticed? Life is better for all of us when I do that. So just do that. Try it today. I always say this is your homework. Try complimenting everybody that you want to be, you know, that you're like, why can't they do it my way? Instead of that, just go compliment them on something rando and see what happens. Everyone's happier. So pair praise. Don't be a stick in the mud about it. Don't be so worried. Um, Praise is a good thing. Uh, and it should be done more often. Okay. So, but the other thing is people go, well, then they're going to be addicted to that. And then that's all they're ever going to want. And life isn't like that. And da, 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 da. No, if you're doing good ABA, there's a schedule of reinforcement and we start out heavy and, and give tons of reinforcement. And then we slowly fade it away. And then we put it on things that the new things, and we don't reinforce the things from before. So there's a schedule of reinforcement and, And we know how often we give reinforcement. And as they get better at the skill or get older, we change what the schedule of reinforcement is. And you don't get reinforced all the time. There's one of the techniques that they have in schedule of reinforcement. I call it the slot machine. That, you know, sometimes you put the quarter in and you get money back, but a lot of times you don't. But it needs to be often enough that you're willing to put the quarter in the slot machine because I might win right? And there's a, there's a schedule of praise that's just like that. And of course they fade reinforcement. We fade reinforcement. We laughed because when my son um, started potty training, of course, anytime he peed in the potty, we were like, yay, you peed in the potty, you peed in the potty. And we would dance and we would sing and we would do all this stuff. You know, he's in college. We're not doing that anymore, folks. There's no need to. But, you know, when he made the Dean's List, hello, we went, you made the Dean's List and lost our minds and danced around and took him to dinner, right? Um, So you move your goalposts. Don't get so hung up in the, well, I don't want to overpraise my child. You know, I know there's a whole bunch of people who are like, oh, we praise children too much and we give them too many trophies. You know what I want to say to those people? Sit down and shut up. Kids have real challenges and they, uh, you know, why aren't we working more to make them happy Um, and to learn? And if making them happy makes them learn, I think we're on the right track. Sorry, that's my opinion on that. Uh, Okay. People say, well, they should just do it because if I ask them to clean their room, then they should just do it because I said. And again, I say to you, how is that working for you? Because you can spend all Saturday saying to them, you should go clean your room, right? And they don't do it. And you can get, you can punish them into it. You can do all of these things, or you can say to them, um, hey, I'm really interested in seeing a really clean room today. And, you know, I know a treat that somebody would like to have if they cleaned their room. Or you can say to them, I, I really want to go do a treat thing today. What would be a good treat thing for you that you would like to do today? And they tell you, you go, okay, so here's what we're going to do. Um, I'm going to set the timer and you've got, you know, this much time to go clean your room and do a really good job. And and if it's super fabulous, then we're going to go do this thing, right? Then the child gets the room clean and you get to go do the super fun thing that they wanted to do. And you didn't spend all day arguing with your child. And, you know, I mean, there's the, who was it? The tiger mom who, you know, said, I'm going to force my kids into doing all those things. And my kids are so much more successful because of it. Great. Wonderful. And she forced her kids into doing all of those things. And then the minute her children could leave, they left, they left. And my understanding is, is they don't have a relationship with her anymore. That wasn't what I was looking for. And it's certainly, I think what most autism parents is like, no, 
That's not what I'm looking for. What I'm looking for is to have a healthy, happy relationship with my child. And, you know, we started by saying it had to be meaningful to them. And in the beginning, cleaning their room just isn't meaningful to them. Why would that be meaningful? What What's in it for them, right? Eventually, you get to the point where the child's like, I really hate it when my room is messy. And they clean the room on, the, on their own. It happens. It happens, you guys. Uh, people say, oh, this is dog training. Well, you know what? You're not entirely wrong. These principles are used also to train dogs, but it's not, we're not, <laughs> it, it just happens that these things work with living creatures. So yes, these same principles work with training a dog, but children are dogs um, and dogs aren't children. But that's how good these teaching techniques are that you can use it on anybody. But it isn't just children. You can use this on your boss. You can use this on your mother-in-law. Corporations use this. Olympic athletes use this. This is not dog training. But dog trainers have learned, oh, that works with dogs too. Just saying. Um, big one that people say is that it'll train them to be victims. Well, my experience is exactly the opposite. Um, but I had good, good ABA and we were very mindful about what was being taught to our child. Do I think that someone could use these principles and, um, and be a predator? Sure. Absolutely. That's why it's an, uh, important for us as parents to be looking out for our kids. Um, but what, and, and it all comes down to what are you teaching? Because if you use this to teach someone to be a victim, yeah. Yeah, you could. You absolutely could. But why not use this to teach a child not to be a victim, which is what we did with our son. We taught our son how to say no and who to say no to. Anybody that was making you do anything that feels weird or awkward. And we reinforced him for saying no. And if he, you know, what he learned was, I can say no, I will say no, I will be backed up when I say no, but I can't just use no all the time. I need to use no when it's appropriate. And we taught him when those times were appropriate. Like nobody touches you without it being okay with no one touches you. And, it, and in the beginning, it was like, nobody touches you where your bathing suit is. And then somebody pointed out to us, no, some people don't like to be hugged. Like, so we taught him, nobody touches you without your permission. And he, man, he knew that rule and he would invoke it. Um, so if a kid kicked him in, in class and he would turn and say, you're not allowed to do that. You're that you did that without my permission. You're not allowed. And he was real militant about it. I love that. People also say that this is un unrealistic, that it's not how the world is set up. And I argue exactly the opposite. This is exactly how your world is set up. Why wouldn't it be the same for your kids? You get up in the morning and you do what you have to do because of reinforcement, because you're getting paid and because you have something to look forward to and because, you know, you're going to get some of your needs met or you change. That is the truth. And so why wouldn't we give that? to our kids. Why wouldn't we? Um, and the last one, people say, I don't want to reinforce my child with food. Yeah, no, I totally get that. Um, food is a primary reinforcer. It really, really, really works. And sometimes at the very beginning when kids are very young and, and it's hard to find a reinforcer, they will give food. You should be a part of that decision making. And I certainly, I used to say, oh, I never allowed them to reinforce with food. And then one of my therapists pointing, one of his old therapists pointed out to me, yes, you did. Very early on, you did, because we told you we need to get to more reinforcers. And then I saw a video and I was like, oh, dang, we did. But um, but it wasn't for very long and it helped him to get to the next thing. So I think show caution with the food thing. Uh, I think lazy people go, we'll just jack them up with sugar because sugar is very reinforcing, but then you lose the time later on. So be mindful, be a part of the discussion and don't let people just artificial color, artificial flavor your child and sugar them into oblivion as a reinforcer. Be careful. Uh, okay. Moving on. I think we have one more slide. Okay. Signs that it's working. Um, and, and this is really the truth. If positive reinforcement is working with your child, then your child will be happier because 
it's specific to them. The reward is specific to them and they will be happier kids. You will also find that they are kids who are a little bit more tuned in. If you know that there's an opportunity for reinforcement that's meaningful to you, you pay closer attention. You just do. If you know, used to be that in Kmart, that you'd be in Kmart and you'd be shopping and all of a sudden they go, we have a blue light special on aisle four where they would just put something rando on sale, right? And so when you'd shop at Kmart, you would listen more to the announcements over the thing in case it was a sale of something that you wanted. And we do see the same effect with kids on the spectrum. They tend, it's like, if I know that I'm in a situation where people are going to listen to me and I'm going to get my needs met and I'm going to get rewards and things that are important to me, they dial in a little bit more. Their focus is a little bit better. Here's something else for fun is that they end up being first responders. Kids, I somebody uh, that I was watching her kids once, she dropped off her kids and she said, now remember to be first responders. And I said, you want them to be firemen? What's, what is this thing? And she said, no, no, no. People who listen and, and do what you ask them to do the first time you ask them to do it. And I was like, oh, first responders. And, and the truth is, is when kids know that they're going to get reinforced praise and other things for listening and doing what you ask them to do, um, they tend to do it right? Now, again, people go, well, doesn't that train them to be victims? No, because if what you've taught them to do is to say no to things that, and what things to say no to, then no. When when those things come up, they go, no, I'm not doing that. Then we all want our kids to be people. If you ask them, hey, put your dish in the sink that you don't have to ask 12 times, but that if someone says, come here and get in this car, that they know to say no, pick me. That was important to me. And that was what my son was reinforced into doing on a regular basis. So um, I have further down safer children. And that's why, because if they know what to say no to, then, and they're reinforced and told, we'll stick with you on this, then they do. I, I left out negotiators though. This makes some comfortable. I don't understand it. They go, well, my child wants to negotiate everything. They're like, well, I'll do this if you give me this. And they're like, I don't want that. Really? That's a budding lawyer. And then you're going to be able to negotiate and get what they want. What they're doing is telling you what the struggle will be worth it. You actually cut out the middleman when they negotiate. Don't be stressed about that. Be a good negotiator back. And when they say, you know, when you say, I need you to get out of the pool, the pool and they go, can I have five more minutes? You can say to them, because that's negotiation right there. You need to get out of the pool. Can I have five more minutes? You need to like stop and think to yourself, can I give them five more minutes? Because a good no negotiator gives a little, gets a little. You can say, yes, I'll give you five, five more minutes. But as soon as we go home, you got to pick up your toys. Okay, mom. Okay, five more minutes. And then you count and go, okay, four more minutes. So that when it's time, they get out of the pool. Now, some of them are going to try to negotiate again. And you can choose again. Do you want to renegotiate? Now you get more. Or you can say to them, I'm sorry, but we have to go in and remember you promised that you were going to pick up your toys. So you need to do that. And then when they do, you praise them for that, right? Don't be afraid of having a negotiator. Just be an equal negotiator back. Don't let them run you. Make sure you get what you need, right? And think about what you need. Oh, I need for them to stay in bed tonight, or I need them, you know, to do their homework. Get what you need back when they negotiate. And of course, what this does is it makes fast learners. Because if I know, if I'm sitting there at the table and I don't want to do the worksheet and you say to me, okay, we're going to do the worksheet, we're going to do 10 problems. And then what would you like to be able to do? Do you want to play on my phone? Um, yes. Okay. So I'm going to set the timer, do the 10 problems and they get right down to it. And we save time and they're like, I'm going to do the 10 problems and I'm going to get it right because I know I'm going to get that reinforcer. And that makes fast learners. Okay, so last slide here. In summation, oh, uh, and I'm way over time here, but in summation, really what we're talking about here is the carrot versus the stick. And our entire society is built around the carrot and the stick. The carrot is something that I'm moving towards. The stick is something that I'm moving away from. And people have learned... Um, my generation certainly learned that when somebody is doing something that we don't like, we throw the stick at them because they need to be punished. 
you know, that's the way we do things and we jump to punishment so quickly. But as discussed earlier, that's effective. Sure, punishment works in some arenas in some ways. Uh, it's not that it's completely in, ineffective. It's just not wildly effective. And all of the behavior studies show the carrot, the carrot, the carrot, the carrot, the carrot is widely effective. And that it doesn't matter what your IQ is. It doesn't matter what your age is. It doesn't matter what your vocal ability is or what your experience is. We all have something we want. And if I want something from you, knowing what you want will help me to get that faster than anything else. That's the truth in all arenas of life. If I'm a lawyer and what I want is to settle this case and I, the only way I'm going to be, oh, there's my line. Uh, the only way I'm going to be able to do that is to negotiate it out. The, my, the strongest thing in my arsenal is knowing what it is that you want. And then I can figure out how much of that can I give to you? This is true everywhere with everything. So if we can see that arrow on the FedEx truck and go, okay, wait a second. If I make my child's life such that he knows if he does this, he's going to get something that's meaningful to him immediately, then he's more likely to do it. Then all of the equations and all the struggle in my life shift. And if everything becomes easier for you and for your child. Now, I said immediate reinforcement because the one thing we didn't talk about is when you can't give immediate reinforcement. But the other day we gave a whole talk about, um, uh, <laughs> why can't I think? Uh, what I, I, I just ha had a total brain bubble. What do you call it when you have the token economy? Thank you. Uh, token economies. And the token economy, what it does is it makes it possible for me to give you a placeholder in that immediacy. So you do something and I give it to you right there. And I've already built into your experience of life that you know you can turn that in for something else later on. That's what money is. So, you know, what you want is a car and you go to work and we can't give you a car because you got to work up towards it and we're not giving you a car at work, right? So what do we do? We give you a paycheck, which then can be translated into a car when you have enough of it, right? We can do that with kids with stickers. I talked about doing hash marks on my hand one day when we were at the zoo. There's all different ways, but it is so important that we remember that positive reinforcement is that immediate. You give it, something happens and you give it to them immediately. And if you can't give it immediately, you give them something that they can use to get some, you give the immediate thing there that they can use. That's the token economy. So it is about immediately. So really what we're doing is pairing the experience with the reinforcement. And that's really the truth of it, because then that makes me want to do it again and again, like Santa Claus. So that's positive reinforcement. And if you're doing ABA, it should be filled, filled, filled with positive reinforcement, which makes happier children, fast learners, first responders, happier lives for parents and teachers. Um, it's just the best thing on the planet. Guys, we're out of time. Tomorrow, we are back with a live show with Dr. Doreen Grampiche. She's answering your questions. I hope that uh, you guys will write in your questions. You can do it right now, either to me, Shannon, at autism-live.com, or you can put them in the chat on autism-live.com. Um, either one of those. So absolutely adore you guys. And I don't remember what Wednesday's uh, topic is. I've totally forgotten, but we'll, I'll remember what it is and tell you tomorrow. But don't forget, tomorrow night... Season three, the final season of Lock and Key. Tune in and watch our fabulous Kobe Bird, okay? And do definitely check out uh, Extraordinary Attorney Wu on Netflix. Um, theater. I don't know. Oh, that's what we're doing. Oh, that's what we're doing on Wednesday. Oh, that's so exciting. On, on Wednesday, we're talking about the power of theater for individuals on the autism spectrum. So that's a really fun topic for me um, because I know the power of theater in everybody's life. Um, that's what mastery is in. So let's talk about that, the power of
of theater and acting and watching and doing um, for individuals on the spectrum. That's what we're talking about on Wednesday. That's going to be fun. Definitely tune in for that. Okay. Got to go, but so have appreciated all of you being here and love, love, love to all of you. We'll see you tomorrow. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you too. Bye-bye for now. If you found anything helpful in this video, please give us a like. In fact, make sure that you smash that subscribe button on YouTube and give us a like on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Instagram for important updates. And please download our free podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much. See you next time.